Hey there, HiVoice here. Let's use Google Chrome's Memory Profiler on a Node.js application. Let's start out with this simple JavaScript application. I have written this application in Node.js so that I can illustrate how to find objects using the Memory Profiler. So basically, this application right here is just a web server that has a single function, hello. When this function is called, it puts 10,000 strings in an array, 10,000 numbers in another array, and 10,000 dates in an array called large dates. We will then use the memory profiler to try to find these objects. I've gone ahead and started the application uh, with the minus minus inspect uh, option. This enables the debugger to run on a WebSocket. I will attach to this WebSocket so that I can use Chrome's memory profiler. Let me switch over to Chrome. So in Chrome, what we can see is that um, I've gone to the page Chrome Inspect. This page can show me all the debuggers that are available on my machine. I've made a video in this playlist to show how to enable this page and how to enable the actual debugger. So go ahead, watch that video that will let you know how to use this debugger. But I've gone ahead and done that. And so my debugger is running on port 9229 and it does appear under the remote target over here. When I click on the inspect button over here, I will then get another debugger, which is the uh, Chrome DevTools. The DevTools has a bunch of tabs. Uh, again, the video in this playlist shows uh, a few of these tabs, what we, what we can do. Uh, I'm going to click on the Memory tab because that's the tab that will show the Memory Profiler. This Profiler tab over here, this is the CPU Profiler. I'll do a video uh, after this uh, with the CPU Profiler. That's a bit more complicated. So let's stick to the Memory Profiler for this video. We are presented with a screen with a few options. The left side over here are the profiles that I have captured. I haven't captured any, so it's blank. The right side is the type of memory profile, and this is the instance that we have. I have a instance that is running and it has consumed 7.5 megabytes. The heap snapshot is an option to capture the entire heap at one go. I'm going to do that first because then I can get a list of all the objects that currently exist. The allocation instrumentation on timeline is similar to the heap snapshot that it captures the entire heap at one time, but then it keeps the timeline open and any new allocation gets allocated on the timeline. It's very good at filtering between a particular point. I will do that later. So basically, if you, if you enable that option, then what you do is you create allocations and you can see the allocations appear in the list. Allocation sampling is the same as allocation instrumentation, but it is light enough that you can leave it for a really long time. You can't leave allocation instrumentation on timeline open for too long because it overwhelms the profiler and it will cause trouble. So we'll start with the heap snapshot, then we'll move on to the uh, allocation instrumentation. Now there's a button over here that's really important. This is the garbage collection button. Click it and it will force a garbage collection. You don't have to do it because whenever you click heap snapshot, it will capture a, a snapshot after garbage collection anyway. It's, it's a bit of redundant, it's a, it's a redundant option. But for allocation instrumentation, you might want to click it uh, if, if you're doing it in the middle of, of the program, if you suspect that it's actually garbage collection. Now, I have gone ahead off camera and actually primed this process so that when I click heap snapshot, there's actually going to be something. So if you don't have any anything meaningful appearing in the heap snapshot, just do something with your program like how I've done and then click heap snapshot. So I'm going to click take snapshot over here and it's going to calculate and it, it might take a while. If it gets stuck at like 95%, uh, don't worry about it. It does take a while to compute if the snapshot is really, really large. In my case, I have intentionally made the snapshot not so large so it it can capture quite fast, but if you have a snapshot, like just say 100 megabytes, uh, be prepared to wait. Okay, so we've got the snapshot over here, 13 and a half megabytes around that. What we have on this side is the objects. So the objects are actually arranged by the name of the constructor. 
Now, not everything has a constructor, not everything is a class, or not everything is a function. So what happens is, for system types, it is actually prefixed by the name of the type in parentheses over here. So if we have an array, it, it just puts a parentheses array, compiled code, string, number. These are all built-in types, hence why there's no constructor. That's how it arranges it. If you click on, on the uh, name over here, it actually sorts it. This is the uh, sorting order. So what we want to do is we want to sort it by the shallow size over here. We want to sort it downwards. What's shallow size? So shallow size is the actual size of the object. So if, if you have a date, the shallow size is the date. If you have a number, the shallow size is the number, an array, the sh that's what shallow size is. The retained size is the size of the object, but also the graph that holds it in memory. Some objects are complicated, so their retained size is larger than their shallow size. I don't really bother too much because mostly it's just small variables that are uh, in memory. I want to find a lot of them, so I just rely on the uh, shallow size. The distance is in the graph, how far it is from the root node. Again, I don't, I don't worry too much, but if the distance is large, it means that the object is very deep and the stack is very deep. Now, I'm just going to sort by shallow size and that will tell me the largest objects that I have created because I intentionally made it very large. Um, if you sort and you can't find the objects that you know, just keep scrolling down. You will eventually find something. Some of it is a bit more complicated, but you can look at the uh, percentage number for a clue whether that object is a lot in memory. We can get another clue up here. If we click on the word summary, we get a drop down with containment and statistics. Choose statistics. What this will give you is this will give you the breakdown of all the objects that are in memory and it tells me that the number of system objects is really large. It's kind of a clue. If you get a lot of like arrays and a lot of like, like probably like named objects over here, you can kind of use that to drill down. The other option is containment. Containment is the memory layout in how it's actually laid out in memory based on the graph. I don't find this useful. Uh, it's very difficult to sort through this. Um, if you're interested in like how it's actually arranged from, from the first block to the last block, definitely go through containment. I'm going to skip that for now since containment is really difficult to read, but it gives you the knowledge of how the structure is. I'm going to stick to summary. It makes it, makes it a lot simpler. So I'm going to just select date because I know I made a lot of this in memory and I'm going to drill down on the date. When I expand on date, there are 50,000 of these, so I'm, I'm not going to click on each one. I'm going to click on the first one, the first date over here. What I get is I get a breakdown over here of where the memory was allocated. Now, this is very important. When a JavaScript object is created, the line that creates it is the start of the graph. Um, where it's stored isn't actually the start of the graph. That's like, like a different point. So because of that, when I click on the date, it tells me it was allocated from this location over here. Now, I can go in pretty deep if I want to, but I don't want to. I'm just going to take the shallowest part that has a code line over here, index.js8. And if I click on it, what it's going to do is it's going to take me to the file system in sources. I have added my source code using add folder to workspace. Um, if you want description how to do it, watch my previous video. I show how to add the folder to the workspace. If you have done that, what's going to happen is it's going to jump here and it shows me that line 8 is the function I was calling. And observe that even though line, the date is on line 12 that I create a new date, it still measures it as line 8 because it goes by which function and then within the function, what created the memory. Hence why, the, that's why the stack is very deep. If you have a lot of anonymous functions, a lot of closures, it will actually record the last one. So in my case, large dates has this, this line new date over here. It's being pushed in, but because it's measured by this particular anonymous function, you see it's an anonymous function. That's why if I go here, it measures it as here. So large dates added from this anonymous function. Now this is pretty good. We can, we can actually see where this object was allocated on the stack. But a lot of times we need to see it in a timeline. The reason is that we want to see the new objects that are coming onto the stack. And what we can't see here is when this object was allocated. The when is very important. So let's capture an instrumentation on a timeline. What you do is you click profile over here and you choose this option here, allocation, instrumentation on timeline. So if you click this, click record stack traces on for 
of allocations. Um, this is so that the stack is captured each time a new object is created. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click on the start button over here and that's going to start a new timeline. So this is a new timeline. What I'm doing off screen, uh, you can't see it, it's off screen, is I'm actually priming this function. I'm going to call it three times. And what that is going to do is there's going to be three blips over here. This is the first one, second one and the third one. So I'm going to stop the, um, the recording so that it uh, finishes up. So what I have here is it has recorded a timeline. Uh, it's not going to show me all the objects on the in the uh, memory, but it's going to show me all the new objects since the point of the st since I started it. It's going to show me all the new objects from that point. So let's filter it. What we do is we just select on the timeline over here, just select all three blips over here because I triggered this function three times, so I kind of know it's it's these three. Then what what happens is when we do that, the it it filters it down here. So it has filtered it to date. Uh, array and number and these are exactly the things that that I have been incrementing. I've been incrementing the array, the number and the date each time the function is called. So when we filter it this way, what we get is we get pretty much the same view as, as the snapshot. But in this case, if I drill down, I am getting the allocation when this blip happened. If I narrow down the filter even more, I'll get even less objects, but it helps me find uh, what was allocated after the initial point when I started this trace. This is exceptionally handy when you're tracing a long running process. You can just start it at a particular point and then end it where you think the memory is going up and you can just see what's being allocated in that portion. Now, if I click on summary, I get containment, which is the layout of the memory. I, I'm not gonna go to containment, it's too complicated. Uh, statistics is pretty useful. It's going to show me what was allocated in that portion. So if I chose a certain portion of memory, this is the actual statistics of what was allocated in that portion. But I get another option. I get allocation. If I choose allocation, what I get is I get the list of all the objects created, but it's going to arrange the objects by the uh, the actual function that was called um, in order to trigger the recording. So if I go down here, I can see that the count of objects increased dramatically by index.js8. Let's click on it. And there we are, index.js8, that's my function. So that's what this option uh, does. It allocation shows me the number of counts. Extremely useful because this number of counts can indicate the number of times we are allocating. If you have very small objects, it's hard to find it in the memory size, but we know that the count is high. So in my case, because I was allocating thousands of objects per count, I get a very high memory count uh, when I use the count uh, instrumentation. This doesn't appear in the heap snapshot. So this is extremely useful when you have a lot of small objects being allocated. Now in the profiler, other than allocation instrumentation, there's also allocation sampling. Uh, these are the same. They are the same thing. This allocation sampling, uh, what it does is it's a very light sampling. It just goes and samples at particular times. Um, you might just miss the allocation. I don't like using this. Uh, they say that if you have a very long running uh, application, go ahead and use it. I have not found a reason to use allocation sampling. I just I just try to use allocation instrumentation. And if the process is very large and this thing breaks, well, the process is just too big. So it, it won't be difficult to try to figure out what to cut if the process is way too big for allocation instrumentation. Now, the final part of interest is that um, when analyzing heaps and allocation timelines, if it's difficult to reproduce the problem, um, if it's, if the captures are really large, you can click load and save. You, if you click on here, you can, you can click save over here. They both have save and you can click load over here. Uh, you can save the dump to disk in a big file and then you can just load it up later for analysis. Very, very useful. I, I don't use it that much. I don't really capture things that are so large and difficult to analyze that I need to load and save. But if you want to, it's there. And finally, you have the options over here, whether you want to clear all the profiles or you want to repeat the capture again. Um, yeah, just clear it once you're done or just, just press here and close the entire profiler once you're done. I use memory profiling a lot, really, really a lot especially with Node.js containers and servers, especially those that, that, that sit very long running. If memory keeps growing up, you know, the, the cost of a container just keeps increasing. Uh, so I use a lot of profiling and this is exactly the technique that I use. 
it's not really that sophisticated but you have to give it a, a bit of time to try to like just figure out like the pattern and how it it captures um, it's a really simple technique and definitely give it a try if you have node.js definitely give it a try a gentle reminder to subscribe give a like and hit that bell icon to be notified of new videos it's been a pleasure presenting this information i am high voice signing out